Welcome to A Dram of Outlander. This is Desiree, your podcaster and the writer for adramofoutlander.com. For all things Outlander, from the Dinah Gabaldon book series to the Stars TV series and everything in between. This is Of Lost Things, S3, E4, podcast episode 103. Well, hello! By now you have seen this episode, and if I sound a little sniffly, it's because I just watched it for the second time before recording the podcast. I see why Diana Gabaldon said that the end of this episode was her favorite scene in this season, I believe, is what she said. Wow. Powerful stuff. And before we begin, I want to give a huge shout out to Bear McCreary. The music was off the charts this episode. It was beyond expectation. In the podcast link, I will post uh, a YouTube link to Bob Dylan singing Hard Rain. It's a different version. That's what's in the episode but it is spectacular and I can't help but belt it out and sing along and sniff. (laughs) Now forever, this song will mean something completely different. Absolutely fantastic. So this episode of Lost Things was written for television by Tony Graffia and was directed by Brendan Marr, just like last episode. So amazing. Uh, There were quite a few comments from the last podcast, which I will try and get to at the end of this one if it's not incredibly too long. And I'm glad to see that most people, most listeners were very understanding of Frank's plight, though some still don't like him, and I understand that too. Wow. So this episode was really, the majority was about Jamie. There was not nearly as much of Claire and Brianna and Roger in 1968 as there, as there was the years of Jamie being at Hellwater for eight years, 1756 to 1760. This episode really, again, covered so many years, eight years of Jamie's life at Hellwater as a groom all the things that happened and what led up to him being there for so long. And the Dunsanys had come home from holiday. Lord Dunsany was aware that a new groom was there that Lord John had brought. And he knew the circumstances of Jamie's background and said his wife would not approve. So he's going to give him a little bit of a stipend of pay and say he's a groom That was recommended by Lord John, who's been a dear family friend since he was a child and their son Gordon had been killed at Culloden. So John is basically the stand-in son. He helps with things since there's only two daughters and Lord Dunsany is getting older. So it's kind of the buildup for that. And it's so hilarious when... Lady Dunsany, Geneva, one of the daughters, comes to do her daily ride, and Jamie has no idea why the men are drawing straws. It's because they can't stand taking her out. She's a bit intense. She's holier than thou. She thinks she's above everyone. And while she's waiting for her horse, she makes some rude comment. Hurry up, you useless Scotchman, because Jamie is taking too much time to get her horse out of the stable. I mean, she's portrayed as just a queen bitch. Like, she's very complicated and difficult. And she always has a sour look on her face. And after she rides off with the groom who took the shortest straw, Jamie says to one of the other men that a boot in the hindquarters is what that one needs. (laughs) That's a great line. And her sister Isabel overhears it. And it's interesting to see the different relationships that Jamie is sort of forming here, that Lord Dunsany is 
willing to have him there and not treat him like a prisoner, though he is. And bygones be bygones. He's not going to hold it over his head that his son died at Culloden because John says that Jamie is a man of principle and honor. And then Geneva is just sort of nasty to everybody. And Lady Dunsany is sort of left out of this for now. But Isabel comes and chats with him. And she talks about how she wishes the horses were free. And that one cage, that all cages are a cage, basically. Just because the stables are the best that Jamie's ever seen doesn't mean the animals still aren't caged. And so it's fascinating to see her character and what she's about. So we really get her a bit more in depth than we actually get Geneva. And since the story is that Jamie worked for Lord John, she wants to know how long Jamie worked for him. And Jamie says that he was in his charge. So Jamie tells the truth, even though she thinks it means something else. And Isabel is clearly fascinated with Lord John, and she's interested in him as a husband. And Jamie tries to caution her, saying John is basically married to his job as a soldier. But that's one of the things that Isabel finds so attractive. So Jamie tries to do that, which I found to be a little interesting character-wise. I mean, they've just met him. Not much time has passed since they returned from holiday, and Jamie's new in his position. But he's speaking so freely to Isabel as if it would be normal for a groom to talk to one of the ladies of the house, it seemed a little too familiar to me. And it just struck a chord that even though he has deference and bows his head and calls him by the proper titles, that he would be so bold as to speak this freely. I don't know. What do you think about that? I found it just a bit cautionary in the sense of odd. And it stood out to me as being something unusual And with Jamie understanding how the class system works, and it was very class-based, that they would never be speaking like that, most likely. I mean, she did ask him a direct question, which he should answer, but offering his input after that about Lord John's status was a little over the top, though I understand why it's there, and it feeds our 21st century sensibilities But in the 18th century, and especially him knowing his place, regardless of his actual education and status as a human outside of this event, this time in his life, it it felt a little too 21st century. That's all. So we learn that Lady Geneva is betrothed to Lord Lord Ellesmere, and he's quite a bit older than she is. She could be his his granddaughter. And after this betrothal takes place, I mean, marriages were made to secure political gain, for monetary gain, for titles, for all sorts of reasons. And this was definitely for money and title. It was a class up from where the Dunsanies were. And Lord Ellesmere, as he's leaving, talks down to Jamie right in front of him, says rude things about his hair, something like he would kill a baby if it came out with hair that color. And that's a bit of quick foreshadow for the future. But he's nasty to Jamie. But on the other hand, not the color of Jamie's hair, but the styling of his hair in this episode was terrible. It was distracting to me how terrible his hair was like a separate character. I don't know why it had to look so bad. It didn't even look reasonable until the very end of the episode. Okay, that's my aside (laughs) on my fashion sense. So we see more straw drawing because nobody wants to take Geneva out and nobody likes her, but she clearly has a plan and she wants Mackenzie to take her out. And he has to. He has to do whatever they say even though she doesn't know that he's a paroled prisoner, she still has ultimate power over him. 
in the household. So there's this big disparity of authority going on. And as they ride, she asks what he thinks about her betrothed, and Jamie doesn't want to answer her. And she says the man's money is his best attribute. Jamie's trying to be diplomatic here. And she's very bold at him, and she asks him what he finds attractive, and he says he doesn't think about such things, which he doesn't. And he wants to return back to the house because it's getting late in the day. And she says, "It's there's plenty of time, and besides, you have to do my bidding. And then she rides off very swiftly. And then we hear her fall from the horse, and... He rides up behind her and picks her up thinking she's injured and she starts laughing like she's tricked him. She's feigning. She's, and she says, you know, see, I knew you would do what I said. So she's playing hardball and she has a pretty nasty attitude of being upper class, of expecting to get exactly what she wants and she won't have anything else. And this is building in the story. There's something else afoot here. This storyline is rising and he's so angry at her for doing that, that he drops her in a mud puddle and I can hear people cheering. It was hilarious. I'm like laughing my ass off. That was awesome. (laughs) He's so mad that he does that. And then he rides off and she thinks it's funny. She just has this wicked laugh and She says she looks forward to their next ride, but she's definitely strong-willed and I think dangerous is what we're seeing here. And Lord John had said he would come every quarter to check on Jamie. And we see them playing chess somewhere on the grounds. And this also does not fit the class system of the times. And it doesn't matter if they believe that Jamie worked for John, that the propriety of the time, they would never be playing chess. John would have had to have had a reason to go to the stable to talk to Jamie at all. They would not have been able to openly have discourse and walk together and have discussions and play chess. That was not how the class system worked. It would have been very strange for him to do so. And again, I understand why it's there, but it just, it feels awkward because of all how much of the other class things that we're seeing and the importance of it. And even Jamie being in deference and bowing and calling them by their proper titles to have them just sitting there out in the open playing chess. Very strange to me. And then Isabel and Geneva come up and with them is Colonel Melton. Hal, John's brother. And apparently John did not disclose that he was holding Jamie's parole and that Jamie was at this estate. Hal looks very unhappy in his most subtle way. And in the army structure and how everything worked, Melton would have known. John would have had to have told him. It, this, it wouldn't have happened this way. So there's been a little bit of extra artistic license taken, and that's okay. I'm a huge fan of history, so... (sighs) All right, just take a deep breath. (sighs) we got to get rid of that and move forward. So Hal basically makes the point that he would have not brought Jamie here in reference to Isabel asking how they could let Jamie go from their employee. Well, Mac, Alex Mac McKenzie. And John understands what Hal is saying to him. It's pretty sharp. And during this whole exchange, Isabel is flirting with John and Geneva is picking up on the subtle weirdness here because she can't quite figure out Like, why would Lord John be playing chess with a groom, even if he had been in his employ for a year and he was highly regarded? It, it's odd. Like, why does Jamie act the way he does around Colonel Melton? He gets really stiff and his demeanor changes. 
So she's picking up on the subtle cues that are going on around her. Geneva visits Jamie next, and she visits him while he's doing work openly at the stable. He's shoving horse shit, and there are other people milling about. This is not a place of privacy whatsoever. And, you know, she says that she's merciful and he should be thankful. She didn't tell her father that he dropped her in the puddle. And so these subtle threats are coming out in the beginning. And she asked Jamie if he'd been married before, and he said he had been. And she says he's coming to her bed, like he knows what to do. And he goes to refuse. He tries to refuse. He thinks she's crazy and he's totally offended and wants her to go on her way. And then she threatens him with prison because she plied Hal with port and got out of him who he was, really. And then he's read Jamie. His home is Lollybrock. And she's sure if she tells her mother who he really is, that she will have his parole revoked and he'll go back to prison. And if that's not bad enough, because Jamie doesn't want to go back to prison, she threatens his family about sending soldiers to Lollybrock. So this is a full court press. She's blackmailing him to go to bed with her, threatening his family, and he believes she'll do it. I mean, he really reluctantly agrees. He does call her a bitch and she gets upset with, you know, him because he's, you know, he's mad that a a woman of worth would ask somebody below her station to come to bed with her. Like he's, he thinks it's terrible and that would go against Jamie's sensibilities. And she's offended. He talks to her that way and then he totally gets dead in her space. And, but he has to agree. His hands are tied. Now, could she have really plied Hal with enough booze that he would say something? This man is a career soldier. He's a colonel. So I don't know if that rings real true, but the point has been made. Now, I'm clearly in the camp that believes that Geneva Dunsany is using her power and her authority, which is completely 100% above Jamie, even as a groom and as an employee of the household, she would have ultimate power. But now she knows who he really is. So it's extreme power. He can't say no to her. Or she can cry rape. Or she can try cry whatever, and he will be tried for it. She will be believed. She's the one in who has the status and position. I don't care how good looking Jamie is. I don't care how many women want to jump in his pants. The fact that she's blackmailing him, I don't care for what reason. She's a sexual predator. I don't care if she doesn't want an old man to deflower her. She probably could have asked Jamie straight out and explained her situation, and he may have taken pity on her. He may have agreed to it out of compassion for her situation. Because, of course, who wants to do that? It's deplorable. So he reluctantly agrees because he believes he has to, to protect his family and to protect himself. But she is a sexual predator. That's rape. That's what it would be called if a man did the same thing to a woman, it would be called rape. Or a man did the same thing to another man, it would be called rape. Sexual coercion. He really did not consent. So I'm just putting that out there because I know there's a fair amount of fans who just think that ends justified the means and she was fine to do that. It's never okay to coerce somebody and it's never okay to sexually coerce somebody and blackmail them. It doesn't matter what package you're getting. So there's my 27 cents on that topic. Jamie goes to her room that night as he said he would and he sneaks in the house. She tells him to just robe and she turns her head and then kind of looks at him as he's undressing and then turns her head again. 
and he says that she he can he says she can watch him and so she does and he just disrobes and she gasps when she sees his back i'm thinking she should be gasping at that totally fine ass right in front of her cuz it is the man works for it <laughs> There's no disputing it. Mm -mm. We all can appreciate the glory of Sam Hewen. That's for sure. But she gasps when she sees the marks on his back. And he assures her that they don't hurt. But it's shocking. And Jamie normally doesn't show anybody his back. So was he doing it for shock factor? To say, this is what your people have done to me when they've been in positions of power? Maybe. I would have to tweet Tony Graffia or the other writers to find out if there was deeper meaning to that in their mind when writing the scene. So he does, and he completely disrobes, and she's in a gown, pajama gown, a very beautiful one, and he stands right in front of her buck naked. And as she's talking to him, you can see that even though he's not happy about doing this and he doesn't like her, he finds the compassion for her circumstances and he wants this to be a good foundation for what sex is for her. He could have just thrown her on the bed and had sex with her and left. Deflowered her, right? He didn't have to like teach her anything, show her anything, be kind to her, but he was. And she says she doesn't know what to do. And that's when he just melts a little bit and says, okay. So he asks if he can touch her and he touches her and then she touches his body and he goes through the, the process telling her and exposing her to something that's a healthy experience, which I can appreciate, <laughs> especially for a young woman who's been told nothing and she's not likely going to get really good sex from her like betrothed, right? He's an older man and probably doesn't care about her feelings or desires. But Jamie wasn't going to do that. So this is treated very well. And yes, you can't help but feel for her in that moment and feel his compassion for her and still think she's a predator. Because I do. It doesn't matter why she's doing it. It's still wrong. And she used the power disparity to get it. So... One thing in here is that Jamie would not allow her to use his real full name or to call him Jamie. She has to call him Alex. And he says it won't hurt her if he's slow and careful, basically, that he'll do his best for, for her. And he does. And he warms her up and they go through the act. And afterwards, she says she loves him. And I love him as an adult explaining to her that this is not love she feels that she could have this with any man. It's not particular. It's the feelings that have been roused in her body. And they're good, but that's not love. And that love is really giving your heart and soul to somebody else and them giving their heart and soul to you. That's what love is. This is not love. And that's such a beautiful piece. And that comes from the books. And Tony integrated some of this stuff really well. It's seem seamless. And if you haven't read the books, it's okay. And thinking about Jamie in this situation, I thought it was interesting that he allowed her to kiss him like on the mouth, like he would share his body, but he wouldn't kiss her, you know? And so I was like, wow, would he really kiss her? Like he would do everything else. He had only had sex twice in like 11 years. She's a beautiful young woman. So, hey, I mean, you're going to be here. May as well enjoy it if you can. <laughs> so that I had, that struck me interesting. I don't know. It just seems like he wouldn't have allowed that because even though he could share his body with her and in, in a form of teaching her something when he found that compassion, that a kiss might be too intimate almost. The next scene that we see with them is her and her husband, Ellesmere, coming to visit and she's vastly pregnant. And it's so icky 
of thinking of virginity as a commodity. People still do it today, and I just don't understand it. It's horrifying <laughs> to be using someone's virginity as money, as commerce. Ugh. It's terrible that women would be such property and that our vaginas, having seen no other penis, was more important than anything else, almost, except, you know, outside of title. But as Geneva's going by and getting out of the carriage, she's looking at Jamie. And then her birth happens, and she goes into labor, and there's distress. Something is going on, and Isabel tells Jamie they have to go to Ellesmere because something is wrong. So they get there to find out that the baby's been born, but Geneva's been bleeding. And the baby's healthy, but then we see Isabel crying, and her sister has died from a postpartum hemorrhage. And I do have a podcast on postpartum hemorrhage and childbirth practices and preventions. I'll put the link in the, this post as well if you haven't listened. There were herbs and other things to try um, in the 18th century. And I have no idea what a physician would have done. Did he try to bloodlet her? If there had been a midwife there, she would have used varying herbs like Claire would have employed at that time. They would have had vast knowledge on s some things to do that could have prevented postpartum hemorrhage. It doesn't happen in westernized countries very much where women die of postpartum hemorrhage, but it is still a, a leading killer in countries around the world. And a lot of it has to do with diet, has to do with postpartum practices. It has to do with lack of prenatal care, lack of health among these mothers, etc. It's And not having things like Pitocin or Mesoprostol to use as anti-hemorrhagics or even IV fluids to help blood build. So there's a lot of things. And if you have questions about that, please message me or ask questions to the phone line, 719-425-9444, because I am a midwife. This is something that I'm actually pretty well skilled in handling. <laughs> this is an area of expertise for me. Uh, so it's really interesting and sad. It's, But that was a reality that how to prevent and treat hemorrhage was not as well known. But the midwives or the wise women would have known far better than a physician of that time period. That I know for certain. Even today, practices between obstetricians and midwives vary enough to where there are plenty of obstetrical practices that cause or increase risk for postpartum hemorrhage um, that midwives often will not employ because of it. So there's still a disparity in the care. So Isabel, when she sees Jamie, actually gets up and slaps him and she confronts him because she says that she knows the baby's his because Geneva said she never had sex with her husband and that Jamie lay with her and she's very angry that the baby is Jamie's and that now her sister is dead and she wants to blame him. And we hear this commotion and this confrontation going on between Lord Ellesmere, who has the baby in his hand with the knife in the other hand, and Lord and Lady Dunsany, they're trying to get the baby from him to take the baby home. Lord Dunsany pulls a gun. Lord Ellesmere says he knows the baby's not his and that Geneva's vagina had seen another cock. Oh, it's horrible. It's just horrible. It's this huge, awful scene. And Jamie gets the gun from Lord Dunsany because he's trying to defuse the situation. And he realizes the baby is indeed his, right? He's probably hoping the baby doesn't have red hair. And so he gets close to Lord Ellesmere, who's backing up. And he just said he would rather see the baby dead than give the baby to the Dunsanys. And he goes to stab the baby and Jamie shoots him. He's dead. Okay. The baby's fine. He didn't get hurt in the fall. And he saved the baby's life and he gets to see this child. And it's sad because it's a child from afar, 
Because as a groom, when the baby's a baby, he probably would not have very much access until the child started riding a horse, and then he could be around him more. So they're back at Hellwater, and Isabel wants to talk to him, and she apologizes for her behavior and that she did want someone to blame and that her sister was complicated and that he was kind to her. And so Geneva did probably tell her sister the whole true story and that Jamie was actually very kind in the process of her sister coercing him. And so I I like that scene a lot. There's some massive moments of tenderness here and where it should be really awkward and it's not. It's just done really well. And you're seeing this friendship being forged almost between Jamie and Isabel, which is really interesting to me. And this baby is this beautiful baby, just this gorgeous baby. And then Lady Dunsany wants to speak to Jamie alone. And she says he's done a great kindness to them, that she knows who he is. She doesn't know his real name, but she knows who he is and that he was in prison under Lord John and that her husband has quite a bit of pull in London and could probably get his parole ended to make him free if he wanted to go back to Scotland because of what he did for their family. And the medical examiner was probably paid off and said it was an accident by misadventure (laughs) and that Ellesmere had killed himself because he was so aggrieved that his wife just died. So Jamie's off the hook. She's telling him he can go back to Scotland right now. And he's so happy. And then he looks at that baby and says, you know, it's really hard in Scotland. And I've been able to send some money back home from working here. And he'd like to stay on for a while longer. And Lady Dunsany says, okay, but whenever he's ready to go, he can go. He's free to go. In her eyes. And we do see that the baby does not have red hair and they've named him William after someone in their family. And I thought all these different things have been handled really well throughout the entire process. Some of the familiarity was awkward, but overall really smoothly done. And now we fast forward to 1764 So it's been eight years since Jamie arrived at Hellwater and William's about seven because of pregnancy length, right? And Jamie is showing him how to ride and giving him more technique. And Lady Dunsany comes with a friend and makes a joking remark about William spends so much time with the groom Mackenzie that he's starting to look like him and act like him. I mean... (laughs) Why would she say that to her friend? That seems like it would cause some more gossip. Hmm. Strange. Oh, and by the laws in the United Kingdom at that time, if a man and a woman were married, regardless of who the biological parent of her child was, they're automatically the legal child of the man she's married to. So it really didn't matter that Ellesmere is Jamie's. I mean, they can't claim it or say it, but young William is the, he, Ellesmere is his title and he is the most powerful person in the house at Hellwater. He's above all of them in class and rank and status. So I don't know about her saying that, Even if she's joking, that could spark more rumors, which would be very odd. And Jamie's, I don't know if he heard it. It kind of looked like he heard what she said. And William was helping him with something. He puts him in a carriage to clean the inside of the window. This kid is like stuck to him like glue. And as Jamie's looking in the reflection in the glass, he notices that William looks like him. And his wheels are spinning in his head. And he decides that it's time for him to leave and to go home. And he and William are walking by the stables and he tells William that he's leaving. 
And William argues with him, and he's really upset and wants to go with him. And Jamie ends up having to scold him, and he actually spanks him on the bottom for dumping something over, which I think might be freshly, fresh cow's milk, or fresh milk of some sort. I'm sorry. And uh, William says he hates Jamie, and Jamie says he doesn't like him very much and calls him a wee bastard, and... William says to take it back because he's not a bastard. And Jamie does take it back and he crouches down and talks to him and hugs him. And he speaks Gaelic to him. And it's a very touching moment. Now, nobody else seemed to be around, but again, they were in the stable area. And that would be pretty dangerous for Jamie to be hugging on this kid, even if the kid hugged him. It seems like the household had looked upon it as Mackenzie and the William spent a lot of time together with him training him how to ride and those sorts of things and that it's okay, but that might be crossing the line just a bit, right? And then Jamie's doing his preparations to leave and he, Lord John is visiting again. It's probably because he's in preparation to leave is what it seems like, or it's just that time of the quarter for him to be there. And he wants... John to look after the boy. And John says it's right for him to leave because anybody with one eye can see that he's starting to resemble Jamie. Just his the way he stands and the things that he does resemble really what Jamie is doing. So they go and walk. And after Jamie asks John if he would stand in and take care of the boy, he offers his body to John. And this is sort of glossed over in the episode, and I wonder if it will come back. He doesn't really have anything else to offer, right? He has nothing of substance. And I can only think that this was a test. And that because if John had, and John sort of laughs it off and he's shocked and he says he should be offended by the offer that he would do, you know, take sexual favor to take care of the boy, essentially. But yes, he will always want Jamie till his day's end. But no, he's not going to take him up on his offer. And I think if Jamie would have hurt John tremendously, <laughs> if John would have tried to take him up on the offer, because he wouldn't be worthy of looking after William if he would do that. I don't know. What are your thoughts? It's always been a point that I've struggled with, whether he would have or wouldn't have. I can't see that he would, based on his experiences, freely do that, that he would actually allow it. I think he would try and kill John if he would have said yes <laughs> to that offer. And that it was a test of the emergency William network. <laughs> and then John drops a huge bombshell on Jamie that he and Isabel are getting married. I like how Jamie was like, married to a woman? That's hilarious. And then he's upset when John says, yes, he's marrying Lady Isabel. And because Jamie thinks that John will use him like he would use a man. And this is really concerning to Jamie. And John understands what he means and says that he had did a trial in London and is sure that he could be an accommodating husband. So he went and tried to have sex with a bunch of different women to see if he could do it and know how to please a woman. And he could, and he did. So he's sure that he can be married to her and be an appropriate husband and there's more to life than carnal love anyway <laughs> in a marriage. And that he really likes Isabel, that she's a good woman. And so Jamie's like, great, I'll respect that. And if you're not trying to dishonor the woman. So that right there, the way he responded, tells me also that his offer may not have been totally genuine and just, hey, I'll have sex with you if you take care of the boy. It was not so clear, cut and dry, because he's not okay with it. And he's not okay with John being a homosexual, but he's his friend. 
but he's still very guarded about it. So John's going to be an insta stepfather to William because Isabel is tasked in raising the boy because her parents are getting older. That's really sweet between John and Jamie here when Jamie vows lifelong friendship to John and they hold, he reaches out to shake his hand and then holds his hat, both their hands together with his free hand. And it does mean a lot to John. And there's an admiration and friendship between the two of them. And they might never be able to be friends truly though, because Jamie's now a paroled traitor. It, and he's not the Laird of Lallybrock anymore. He doesn't really have the status he had before Culloden. And John is moving up in rank. He's the stepfather of Ellesmere. And his wife is a lady. And he's a lord. So it continues to be complicated. And Jamie, as he's thinking about leaving, knows he will likely never see William again because there'll be virtually no reason for him and John ever to see each other at this point. They're going into different places. And the last part of Jamie being at Hellwater, it just gets more touching and more, oh, it's just sad and sweet and a little bitter because we know it's coming to an end for him. And this child that he's on the outskirts of this kid's life has helped raise. So he's putting out his relics, his candles and his St. Anthony, who's the patron saint of lost souls. <laughs> and he's going to pray. And Willie comes into his space and asks him what he's doing. And, you know, only papists do this. And he's like, well, I am a stinking papist kid. And so he explains to him why he's doing it, that he lights candles to pray for those he's lost. And he mentions the people and William wants to be a stinking papist too. And so Jamie baptizes him proper and baptizes him, William James, as his catechism name. Is that right? His baptismal name. And William says, I'm William Clarence Henry George Ransom. Why did you call me William James? And Jamie says that you do get a special name and but you can't tell anybody his grandmother would lose her mind. <laughs> and he's a stinking papist now too. And Jamie gives him a brand new replica of Sawney, like he got from his brother, Willie. And he, that's what he was carving in the beginning of the episode. And he gives it to William to remember him by. I find that a little corny. I understand tying in the snake. It, uh, it feels a bit of a reach little bit, a little cheesy, but I understand. It just seems a little bulky for William to be carrying around. It could have been an old wooden crucifix, rosary, something for him to carry. And William is sad. He has nothing to give Jamie, but Jamie assures him he'll remember him. And this is the part where it's like, oh my gosh, the Dylan song, Hard Rain, comes up and we hear it in the background and the goodbye is horrendous. It's just, ugh, I'm going to get all emotional talking about it, where Isabel and John and William are out front of the estate and Jamie's ready to leave and he says, has hand is on William's head. And then Isabel hugs him and says that they will take care of his son. And I was like, oh, Slade, psh, gone, right? And it gets worse. <laughs> so John doesn't say anything. You know, they just look at each other and Jamie goes to get grab whatever meager items he has and gets on the horse. And as he's riding away, William gets very upset and chases after him. And they have to chase after him and restrain him. Oh, it's just so moving. And that's the scene that Diana Gabaldon said was her favorite one of the season. Oh, sob, sob, sob. If you didn't tear up or cry, 
I don't know if you're human. <laughs> so beautifully crafted. Thank you, Tony Graffia. That was just like, ah, oh, all the gut punches, all the feels, all the lost stuff, right? So, yes. Now, Williams added to Jamie's collection of lost things and lost people. And it's so tragic. Wow, that's taken up almost 50 minutes of the episode already, 45 minutes. And we really get to see more of Jamie. And I'm glad we got to see the religious aspect of Jamie and the importance of his Catholicism to him. I feel like we've been missing out on that component and to have it here was really lovely. And to see really the depth of him and the layers of him and where his strengths are and what matters to him. And I think we've really gotten to know Jamie Fraser in this season far more than we did in season two. We really didn't learn much about him. We didn't see him very well. And to see him really coming into his own in this season is remarkable to me. And I really like it a lot. I think Tony did a masterful job with the script. Yes, I'm going to get to Claire in a minute. And the director, Brendan Marr, just, there were some shots that were really amazing and they just drew you in as a viewer. And, you know, to see how the story built. And again, it was so much material. And that's something my husband, I try and shut up while we're watching. So I'm not feeding him information because he hasn't read the books yet. One day I'll break, I'll wear him down. I'll just will. <laughs> and, he said he was able to keep up with most of it. Like he understood what most of it was, even though they covered so much ground and that it's hard when there's all those things to make sense of in a time period, like eight years. Um, I think what's happening is they're moving through this material so quickly and condensing it so much that once we get to episode six, things kind of, slow down a bit. It's when then we have seven episodes, eight episodes, including episode six to get to the rest of the book. I mean, it's about a third, 30, 40% of the book getting to the print shop. So it's a ton of material. So they've done a good job putting that foundation in. And I cannot even imagine trying to do what they're doing in the writer's room. I think it, in a lot of ways, orig original material is absolutely, totally easier <laughs> than doing adaptable material. Phew. Yeah. That was the greatest song to put at the end of this episode for sure. There's so much sadness in this episode. I mean, it's just bittersweet most of the way through. And we see Claire in Scotland in 1968. She's at the manse with Roger and Brianna, and they're continuing their search. And we see a little bit more of Fiona Graham. She's there, who was her grandmother, had been at the manse with Reverend Wakefield before. And she's kind of taken up that position. And as they're going through, we see a little nod to Fiona crushing on Roger, which comes back later. And we see their storyboard that Roger has painstakingly put together of the timelines between the 18th century and the 20th century. And it looks like time runs parallel. So it's, you know... It, if it's 200 years ahead here, 300 years ahead here, it's the same. So it's, it's running equivalently. So they have to try and find Jamie in the equivalent time, 200 years prior to where they are now. And Claire does find him at, on the Ardsmuir rolls, but they haven't been able to find him after that. And Claire is just beside herself in this episode. She's really, she's not happy with how things are going. She's worried that 
she's following a ghost like Mrs. Grimm warned her against. And she's kind of hitting her wall of what she should do. We see some good interplay between Roger and Brianna. They're broken down on the side of the road and Brianna fixes a distributor cap was loose and she fixes it right up. And she tells him that Fiona is crushing on him and wonders if Fiona was his girlfriend. Yeah, so she's fishing for information. Turns out, no, there's no girlfriend. He just has friends who are girls. <laughs> so they're building their relationship too. Joe Abernathy calls the manse and he's trying to get information out of Claire as to when she's going to be home. And she can't really tell him. And she's pretty terse with him when he wants her back at the hospital. And he shares about a patient coming in who's sick again. And she says he can handle it. And she basically just says goodbye and hangs up. So she's really unsettled throughout this episode. She's gruff and she's a little anxious and she's angry, it seems like, and worried. And one of the things for Claire that hits her so hard is Fiona brings her the pearls that she had gifted to Mrs. Graham after she returned to her timeline. And Fiona brings them to her and saying, I, my grandmother gave these to me, but I thought they would be meaningful to you. And she gives back her pearls that Jamie gave her. And this completely throws Claire off her rails for a minute. And she's just thinking and she's in her head and you can tell that she's so unhappy and she's more aloof now. Brianna comes in and calls her mama and this just warms clear up momentarily and they hug. And so we're seeing all these emotions running through Claire and she's fighting her emotions versus her logic. And I think she's tired of looking and it's hard on her. And she's taking a sabbatical from the hospital and now Joe's calling her to come back and she's getting pulled in different directions. And we see Bree and Roger chatting and Bree is worried that she's a terrible person because she doesn't really want to find Jamie Fraser because then her mom might leave. And then what if something happens to her there? And what if she can't come back and she's feeling really close to her now and she's selfishly worried that her mother will leave or won't and what's going to happen. And Roger thinks that means being a loving daughter and, he kind of doesn't want to find Jamie either because that means Brianna will go back to Boston when he does. So he's telling her what he, how he feels about her. And you can see that they're having this budding relationship more than a romance, but they're definitely attracted to each other. Roger had found out that there were ship manifests in Edinburgh going back and they were hoping that they could look through all of them from the time of Ardsmere closing to figure out where the men had gone. Well, the manifests were only from the 1600s. They didn't go into the 1700s. They just aren't there. Claire's agitated. She slams a book down and they can't get anywhere further at this point. And we see them sitting in a pub and all the men are staring at them because the women aren't supposed to be sitting there. And Claire is just refusing to go sit anywhere else. And I don't think this is a manner of her feminism as much as she's pissed and she's not moving. She's not going to help somebody else's sensibilities out. She's just going to sit there because it's Claire and she's not moving. She doesn't care what they think of her. And there's someone doing a Robbie Barnes poem. And she gets to the point of freedom and whiskey and Claire shares that that's something she used to quote to Jamie and she worries that she's following a ghost like Mrs. Graham had warned her about. And Roger and Brianna are both super supportive and that it's just a setback. They're going to find him. And Claire thinks it's time to throw in the towel and just go home. And she says it's time to go after 
She lifts her glass and says to all of those we have lost, and she drinks. But it's time. And in this moment, there's that cut to Jamie and Willie, and he says, it's time for me to go home. So they're both saying it. Again, they're showing these parallel things going on between Claire and Jamie. Even though the timelines are a little askew, they both are going through the same processes on their own. And Claire is not happy. She's sad. Roger's sad because Brianna is leaving and Claire is leaving. Bri- Brianna's sad for her mother and for going back to Boston. So this episode just ends on such a not dry eyed note. It's not uplifting at all. This is the, oh, before we start rising back up, the tension is building and we see Claire and Brianna on a plane heading back to America and the song is playing because they're cutting back and forth. And yeah, there's not a whole lot here for Claire in this episode. We just get the sense that she's tired. She's done. She doesn't know if she's doing the right thing. And she's got to go home and get her head straight and see what's what she's going to do. And my guess is that they will find Jamie in the right timeline because Roger will keep digging even though Claire has left. That's my thought. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. And it's so crushing to see Claire being excited one t- at one moment and then just thinking it is all lost and there's nothing more for her to do. I mean, we clearly know that's not the case because we've all seen the previews and that she does indeed go back. However, we don't know which avenue that's going to take and that will be revealed in episode 305. So we are, we're having this grief, this continued grief, like it's never going away. And Jamie alluded to that as well as that you just don't forget. And they're always there. And we look, I'm sure you, as well as I do look forward to them clipping the grieving and finding that joy again, really finding that joy. Jamie seemed lighter in this episode than the prior three where he's genuinely calm and confident and smiling. And he found a sense of normalcy at Hellwater. And until it became obvious that the boy looked like him, he was living in this sort of dream world. And he had found that touchstone of, of just normalcy in life. But then it was shattered because he can never claim this child as his own. And it just fell down around him and he had to leave. And what is he going back to? Are those his people anymore? Will his home remember him when he's been gone so long? I mean, it's a long time since he's been gone. I mean, first he hid in a freaking cave for all those years. And then now he's been, he was in prison in Hellwater. And it's 1764. I mean, we're looking at 19 years post Culloden. 19 years. So Jamie's been gone for 13 years. It's a, man, that's a long time. And Claire was building up to this, oh, we could find him. And then dead ends, dead ends. And her bubble was burst. And she's going back to a home Will it remember her? Will the home in Boston feel like her own that she shared with Frank? I mean, she's been gone a while. Will the hospital still feel like home? So they're going to both be struggling with that. Gosh, will it feel like home to Brianna after all that's happened since her father died? We don't know. I look forward to seeing how it uh, unfolds in front of us for sure. And I just want to reiterate to you guys how much I adore you. And I thank you for listening because this month, since the show came back on, I've had 
the highest amount of listens and several of the episodes and not even being a month old have enough downloads to be in the top 20 percent of podcasts that are downloaded so i appreciate you so much keep sharing the podcast share the posts share the social media that's how you can help invite people to the twitter and to the instagram and to the facebook page a drama of outlander group you have to ask to join a drama of outlander page is public on facebook Dram of Outlander on Twitter and Instagram. The website is adramofoutlander.com and you can go there and listen to all the other episodes. And if you haven't read the books and you're inspired to, I have a Voyager read along, Scottish prisoner read along, and one of the novellas as well. And old episodes from seasons one and two are also there. Oh, and that was one thing in the episode that I didn't point out that there was a nod to the Scottish prisoner because Dunsany, when he met Jamie, said, oh, so you're the Scottish prisoner. So that was a nice little thing for Tony Graffia to put in or whoever wrote the base script, however it works. So go and read the Scottish prisoner if you're one of the book readers. If you haven't, please do. It makes sense to this season and gives you so much detail and background it will just make it more enjoyable for you to get to know Jamie Fraser and John, as well as the Dunsanies a little bit. So if you had to guess what was coming next based on the preview, let me know, because I'm really curious. On the Facebook page and on the Facebook group, I actually have a section that people can talk freely once the On Demand or the Stars app viewings can happen at midnight Eastern time on Sunday morning. The, because the show doesn't air officially until Sunday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern time, 5 p.m. It would be 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain, 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Pacific. That we have a zone, a place to talk so you can talk freely after you watch it at any time, and you're not going to spoil people who haven't watched it. So I look forward to hearing from you. And again, thank you for supporting the show, which another way you can support is financially by going to patreon.com and offering a monthly pledge. Or you can do a one-time offering to me and just email me at contact at a dram of Outlander. Dot com or leave me a voicemail on 719-425-9444. And keep listening. Keep sharing it. Tell other people about it. Go into iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, however you listen, and leave a review for me. That will help people find me and have more people listen and enjoy the show like you do. I hope you have a fantastic week, and I am thrilled for this season overall. And I think they're doing a great job of showing us the characters and the complexities and the depth of them this season. And I'm really happy to see Jamie Fraser coming into his glory. And thank you, Tony Graffia, if somehow you hear this podcast, for doing really good justice to the Geneva Dunsany scene and not making excuses for her, but showing Jamie's compassion in a really kind and generous way. And to my listeners, thank you, thank you, thank you. And until next time, Slangeva.